mean, it didn't change like my scope of practice at all, but it changed our day to day pretty much dramatically. All we were doing was seeing COVID-19 really for months on end. So it was draining. And how, like, I know in Michigan, everybody's eligible. It didn't change like my scope. Oh. <laughs> Like how's how's everybody like in terms of like the vaccination idea in Indiana? Like if everybody having a pretty good message on like getting that done and it's variable. Um, I think overall Indiana has a fairly high vaccination rate compared to other states, but right. like all parts of the country, there are people that are hesitant to get vaccinated. Yeah, that's true. Um, can I see? Hey guys, there's a lot of people coming in. Um, we are still about in a minute out and we'll get started in about a minute. Uh, in the meantime, if you guys want to drop in chat, like where you guys are from and what um, what you're studying and, you know, what grade you're in right now, it'll help us understand, you know, what, we're, what kind of audience we're working with. All right, I'm just gonna get started. It's about eight o'clock, um, so let's get started. Um, before we get started with the, uh, with the call, I'm just gonna make a few announcements to get uh, everything straightened out before the call. Um, like you guys know, I start this out. If you're, if you're somebody who's new, typically this is gonna be the information that you, you're gonna be most confused about, so I just like to get that ahead. But if you've been um, attending our calls, you'll, you'll already know about most of this information, but I'm just gonna get this out for somebody who's new and coming here for the first time. So uh, our call today is gonna be about 45 minutes to one hour long. And um, after the end of the call, you have an opportunity to verify your hours. Um, so you can do that by um, sending us a summary about three to five sentences, nothing too fancy, We're just looking for you to, the point of summary is just for us to see that you came and you learned something and you took something out. And the reason why you might need verification is that the, these these hours might count towards your school or you might need to uh, have some hours. Um, so that's a good way to do it. Um, and you can actually write summaries for all of the calls that we've done so far, only for the 2021 sessions. Um, and all those summaries, if you've been compiling them, like a lot of you might know that it's due, it'll be due by June 15th. So, and you can wait, we recommend that you wait until like, you know, close up and compile all your summaries together and send them in one email. Um, it'll be, it's easier for us um, to just, you know, have all together and just send them all together rather than doing one by one. But that doesn't mean that you can't send them as you go. If you know, we understand that some people might need them earlier. So if you want to send them as you go, that's fine too. And if one other, another <clears throat> thing about it is to, um, we, we do get backed up sometimes. Um, it's all, um, people doing by this hand, like we don't have uh, automation. So it can take us time, but give it about three to five weeks uh, before um, getting back to us in terms of like where it is. Um, but it's been more than that. You can always message us and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, and one more thing, um, those of you who might not know, we also offer volunteer opportunities. And if you're looking for that, go check out our Instagram page on volunteering. It's at officialclubmed.volunteering. I know because of COVID, like things got shut down and, you know, starting to get better, but not really. Um, so if you're looking to do something from your home and you need your volunteer hours for your school, or your program, uh, be sure to check, them out, uh, check the page out. There's a lot of cool opportunities and all that information is posted in the bio, as well as information about um, summaries is also posted in the bio. So if you need to uh, visit, be sure to check that out in the uh, bio. And if you have any questions about anything, um, DM us on Instagram and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Okay, that's it for announcements. Today, we have a very exciting guest. Her name is Kristen Burton. She is a PA uh, from Indiana. Um, she's a physician assistant in pulmonary and critical care. She has served on the board for Indiana Academy of Physician Assistants, um, and she's affiliate faculty for the Butler University's Physician Assistant Programs. And she's also founder of Strife Coaching. And I'll let um, Kristen talk more about it. Hi there, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. I'm really excited to talk to you guys tonight. 
I know it's been a really tough year for getting experience on what life as a healthcare professional in any field actually looks like. And I've personally had to tell a lot of people no to in-person shadowing. So I'm glad I can do this type of event and hopefully um, help you guys kind of figure out what you're hoping to do in the future. So with that, I will go ahead and share my slides. While she's doing that, guys, if you have any questions about what we're talking about, be sure to drop them in the chat and I'll try my best to get those answers as soon as possible. All right, guys, so this is me. Um, I work in pulmonary critical care as a PA. Um, this is my Instagram handle, I'm on there. Um, so by all means, follow along. I talk about a bunch of different stuff on that platform. Um, this is my bio and really this is what um, was already said. So again, I work in pulmonary critical care. I've done a bunch of different things um, in the world of academia. I'm an adjunct faculty at Franklin College, affiliate faculty for Butler's PA program. I've done legislative stuff with our board and now have kind of jumped into the realm of entrepreneurship. So I really like using my profession as a PA as sort of a foundation to branch out and do a lot of different things. And it's one of my favorite aspects of being a PA. So let's talk about just briefly why I become a PA. I'm gonna go over a little bit of just the training and then I will cover a little bit of the scope of practice as well. So one of the big benefits, of course, is that the duration of training is shorter and thus the cost of training is shorter, is less. So of course, you know, the longer that you're paying tuition, the more you're paying. So although PAs do have a lower salary than physicians, they do have substantially less years in training and less years to pay back as far as um, kind of student loans and that sort of thing when you graduate. My favorite part of being a PA is the flexibility in lateral mobility. So as a PA, you can start out your career in dermatology, and then in 10 years, you can say, that schedule doesn't work for me anymore. I want urgent care. And then 10 years after that, you could say, I think I'd really like to try my hand at general surgery. And you can transition relatively seamlessly. Now it's a lot of work to change subspecialties. And I'll kind of talk about that as I talk about my personal career history, but you can though, you can without going back to school, sort of change the field of medicine that you work in, which is really nice for keeping life exciting, preventing burnout and all those sorts of things. The scope of practice of a PA varies by state and local culture. So in some states, PAs have independent practice, and in other states, PAs have a collaborative agreement with the physician. So that just depends on where you're located. And then even beyond that, what you do in day-to-day -day is really driven by hospital bylaws and kind of the culture of the group. So that is one of the odd parts about being a PA. Some PAs are extremely autonomous. Uh, my job is one of them. And then other PA jobs are less so. So you really have to explore sort of what the role is going to look like before you take a job in the field of PA land. Now, the reasons not to become a PA, um, if you really want to be the person in charge at all times, this job's not for you. Um, being a PA means usually collaborative practice or being a part of a team. And if it's really important to you to be in charge, you may consider an alternate path. I have heard people say, like, I really want an easier path. So that's why I picked PA school. That is really genuinely not true. PA school is extremely difficult and you're expected to learn a lot of information in a very short period of time. It is sort of like drinking from a fire hose. So if you're anticipating going to PA school because something else sounds too hard, again, not the right reason for choosing the PA profession. The other thing I've heard people say is I chose PA because I want work-life balance. Now that is not necessarily always true of PAs. It depends. Just like in the world of Physicians, for example, there are some physicians that work 40 hours a week, and there are some that work 80 hours a week. That is true for PAs. There are some that work 80 hours a week and work nights and weekends and holidays, and there are some that work 40 hours a week. In the world of medicine, it really depends a lot more on your field than it does on if you're a PA or if you're a physician. So 
if those were the main driving factors behind you picking a PA as your profession, I would maybe reconsider your goals when choosing. Here we go. So the training to become a PA is for your undergraduate degree. It is usually biology, chemistry, or similar science. Mostly the prerequisites for PA school are the same as medical school. So all of the same things, microbiology, you know, physics, organic chemistry, all of those things, those are the prereqs for PA school. It is a master's degree. And most of the time that is somewhere between two and three years. My program was three years. I think the national average right now is 27 months, but the program length varies depending on where you go. And then there are residency programs, but they are optional. So some really specialized fields like critical care or neonatal um, intensive care, those things have subspecialty residencies that you can go into if you choose. But again, that's not the standard or necessary for PAs training. So personally, I got a bachelor's degree in biology and health sciences, and then a master's in PA studies. I did not do a residency, but I did do something called a subspecialty certification. So that is a different sort of thing you can do as a PA when you've been in practice for a certain number of years, and you go and take an additional board exam, document competency with certain procedures, and then you get an additional certification indicating that you have knowledge in a specific area of medicine. So mine is hospital medicine. Um, personally, I didn't start my career in critical care and it would be very difficult, I think, to start out as a new PA grad in critical care. I started in hospitalist medicine. This was the perfect way for me to start my career and learn inpatient medicine in general. You see every single type of medical problem working as a hospitalist or in an inpatient internal medicine service. So I really felt like I was able to take a deep dive into inpatient medicine, which isn't something you're always able to do during your PA program, depending on the rotations that you have. After that, I did cardiology. I love cardiology. I did mostly inpatient medicine, about 75% inpatient, and then did 25% in the clinic. And I mostly did our structural heart program and our congestive heart failure program. So for those of you who maybe heard these terms, the structural heart program was TAVRs, Mitroclips, Watchmans, and a lot of alveolar heart disease, which I really, really, really enjoyed. And then I went to critical care. So fortunately, I was able to have a background in inpatient internal medicine and in patient cardiology, which really was able um, to allow me to sort of build off of that and grow into critical care. It's a difficult job, especially for you know, somebody that's right out of school. So I, I really think that having that background knowledge was what enabled me to do this. This is what I meant by lateral mobility. So like in the world of physicians, you couldn't really say, okay, I'm gonna be you know, a cardiologist and then, okay, never mind, I'm gonna be an intensivist now and sort of switch fields um, partway through your career which again is one of the things that I really like about being a PA is that you do have that option to move kind of around. Again, as a PA, there are a lot of other different things you can do outside of being a clinician. So again, you can do academia, you can precept students. I speak for a pharmaceutical company for a medical device. You can serve on legislative committees and do a whole host of things to really round out your career outside of time spent in the hospital or the clinic. Okay, so with that, let's talk about pulmonary critical care. So if you notice, I took the word pulmonary out of here because I work nights full time. And so almost all of what I do is critical care. There's very little pulmonology that happens at two in the morning. So I work night shifts. I work eight hour shifts. There's seven on and then 14 off. So I work one out of every three weeks. It is an incredible schedule. I never thought I would ever work full-time nights in my life until I heard about this schedule. So I really, really, really love that. I love all the time off to do a whole host of different things. So what I'll be describing to you during this talk is what happens at night shift in the hospital.
This is very different than what happens during the day. So I want to preface with that during the day, you'd be rounding. So you would have a list of patients that are admitted to the hospital. You would go see every single one of them and you would write a progress note with a plan of care for that specific day. At night, you don't round. So my shift is very disorganized. It's very much putting out fires and doing whatever new stuff happens to come up. For me, that's exciting, but it does get to be a little bit crazy. So I get there at 8 p.m. The way our hospital is set up, there is a physician and an advanced practice provider, which is a PA or an NP, that's there until 8 p.m. And then there's myself and another advanced practice provider that covers nights. So we have our transition period where they tell us about whatever patients they've accepted from outside hospitals. And then oftentimes there'll be someone who's doing poorly, who maybe has CT scans that are pending, labs that are pending that we're going to be asked to follow up on. One of the large things that we do is see any new pulmonary critical care admissions or consults. So what that means is like, let's say a person comes to the emergency department, they're going to be admitted to the hospital. The hospital service or the internal medicine service may say, you know, this patient's on too much oxygen or their blood pressure is too low. We don't feel comfortable taking this patient. So they're going to go then to the pulmonary critical care service. Once it's decided that they go to our service, we may put the patient in what's called a progressive care or step down unit, or we'll put them in our intensive care unit. When you go to admit the patient, to me, this is like the best part of medicine because this is the initial diagnostics and therapeutics of the patient's presentation. So they arrive, they tell you what brought them there, all their recent medical history, their family history, their social history, and then you figure out, okay, what test do I need to order? What is the differential diagnosis here? What is the likely diagnosis for their presentation? What's the initial management? So for me, it's really the fun stuff. It's like the brand new thing, the case that you get to solve, which rounding is fun too, but many times the patient has already been diagnosed. So what you're doing is sort of modifying care, helping to make some sort of change to move them towards discharge, but you're not always doing the initial what's wrong with the patient type of thing. So our numbers for new, new patients vary. It's usually eight to 12. And again, it's myself and another APP. So we'll split those up. And it depends on how much work an individual patient is, kind of how many each one of us will take. Um, like for example, cardiac arrests that are being admitted to the ICU take a very long time and they need procedures done and all of these things. So when that happens, we'll take fewer patients in order to get all that stuff taken care of. I'll talk about the procedure aspects in a minute. So anyone in the hospital that decompensates, we may be asked to see. We have a rapid response team in our hospital that's made up of a registered nurse and they'll go and evaluate the patient, but very frequently we'll get a call. So this could be new hypotension, a new arrhythmia, a change in mental status, a million things. It could be the patient was just found on the ground in a pool of blood. Um, I mean, I could tell you about a thousand stories, so you never know what you'll find, but whether they're admitted to another group in the hospital, like maybe they're admitted to cardiology or admitted to internal medicine, we'll go, we'll evaluate the patient, create a new treatment plan, and then potentially they may need transfer to the intensive care unit. Anyone that's admitted to the pulmonary critical care service is our responsibility. So typically that's over a hundred patients. Now we do not see all of these patients. I've had people really confused in the past, like, wow, how do you see a hundred patients in a night? We don't see them all. But what happens is if their nurse has any question under the sun, it can be as simple as, can my patient have a diet order so they can order food to a very complicated medication related question. We have to take their call and address the issue. Most of the time, this involves opening the patient's chart in order to give a medically informed answer. So you can imagine with that many patients, you know, we frequently get dozens upon dozens of pages each night of questions about various people in the hospital. We 
perform a variety of procedures. These are the procedures that we commonly do at night. Now, there are other procedures that our day shift advanced practice providers do as well during the day, like thoracentesis, paracentesis, punch biopsies, and things like that. But those tend to never be emergent. For obvious reasons, we don't run around doing non-emergent procedures in the middle of the night. So this is what we frequently do because these are the things that come up that when they need done, they need done right away. So the first one is a central venous catheter placement. This is a picture of a central line here. You can see this is a triple lumen. This is the stuff that comes in the kit that you use to place it. So that goes in a large vein. It can go in the internal jugular, femoral vein, subclavian vein. Arterial line, I don't have a picture of. That is a smaller catheter than the central line. It goes in an artery instead of a vein. It's typically the femoral artery or the radial artery. And that is for hemodynamic monitoring or frequent arterial blood gases. Endotracheal intubation, I'm sure you've all heard of. If anything, I'm sure you've seen it on TV. Um, we intubate a lot at night. And this is a video of someone intubating with a video glide scope style blade here. This is the endotracheal tube and then chest tube placement. And again, that's because, you know, occasionally emergent chest tubes are required. So we will place chest tubes in the ICU. We respond to all cardiac arrests in the hospital. Um, so this is one of the more fun parts of the job. Honestly, codes are fun. Uh, this is a picture of someone defibrillating a patient. We don't use these sort of movie theater style defibrillator pads. We have little sticky pads that go on the patient, but so we'll go to the code, run the code, try to determine the etiology of the patient's cardiac arrest, transfer them to one of our intensive care units and start post-cardiac arrest care. So that's kind of the rundown of what we do. What we do really genuinely varies dramatically by night. Um, you never know what you're going to get. Again, it's an ICU. So they may, there may be three and four codes in a night. There may be no procedures. There may be five intubations. It's really variable and it always keeps you on your toes. Um, the best part of my job in general is that the medicine is so broad. You always see new pathology. There's always something different happening. So there's really genuinely never a day where I feel like I didn't learn a single thing. So lots of variety, lots of fun medicine and the procedures and codes really add a little extra. Okay. So let's dive into a case. Um, I have two cases to review today. This first one is a 41 year old overweight female. She has a past medical history of remote alcohol abuse and remission. And she comes to the emergency department complaining of dyspnea. She states that her child was recently ill with a febrile illness and then improved. A few days later, she developed severe fatigue, generalized malaise and a fever. Now I will tell you that this happened in March of 2020. So at the time, there's no differential. Everything's COVID. All of it was COVID. So, you know, um, in maybe August of 2019, you would go, okay, you know, is this influenza? Is this some other viral infection? Is this a bacterial pneumonia? But in March of 2020, it was COVID, COVID, and more COVID. So she's hypoxic when she gets there. Her oxygen saturation is 78% on room air. Heart rate's 98, blood pressure's normal, respiratory rate's a little fast. Her rapid COVID is positive. We get a chest X-ray, which I'll show you in a minute. Diffuse patchy infiltrates consistent with COVID-19. She's placed on six liters nasal cannula. And at that time, her oxygen saturation is greater than 90%. And then on the six liters nasal cannula, we get an arterial blood gas and labs. So this is her X-ray. You can see, you know, in general, this is a non-specific X-ray. This is just sort of diffuse alveolar infiltrates. But in this clinical setting with a rapid COVID, this is very consistent with COVID-19. This is her arterial blood gas. So for those of you who aren't familiar with arterial blood gases, I've placed the normals on the right-hand side of the table. So her pH is 7.19. She's slightly acidotic. Her... Her um, bicarb is 25, which is normal. 
her PCO2 was 110, which is extremely elevated, and her PO2 is 49, which is low. So this is acute hypoxic and hypercarbic respiratory failure. Now let's say she was just hypoxic. You could increase her to like Optiflow or some sort of heated high flow nasal cannula to correct her hypoxemia. But the fact that she's hypercarbic too means she needs help with, with ventilation. So she ends up being placed on BiPAP or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation to correct both her hypoxia and her hypercarbia. Her follow-up arterial blood gas actually looks a little bit worse. I reevaluate her, and this is probably a few hours after admission at this point, and really she's developing increasing respiratory distress. She's tachypneic. She's using accessory muscles. Her respiratory rates as high as 45, and she gets progressively more hypoxic. So I end up having to intubate her and start mechanical ventilation. Now, there, the COVID intubations are a thousand times different and worse than any other intubation that we'd ever done before. So if you can imagine, you know, you go to intubate a patient, it's an aerosolizing procedure. So any sort of fear for contracting COVID-19 is maximized in the setting of an aerosolizing procedure right in your face. So intubating these people was terrifying just straight out because we were all afraid that we're going to contract COVID-19 from having, you know, respiratory droplets right into our face. On top of that, they are profoundly hypoxemic and the sort of window that you used to have with a nice pre-oxygenated patient, when you would go to intubate them, they wouldn't desat immediately. That was gone with COVID-19 patients. So they would immediately desaturate. They're all very high risk intubations. And then when you factor in the fact that, you know, as healthcare professionals, we're worried about, you know, the pregnant respiratory therapist that's in the room and ourselves and the nurse who's 60 getting COVID it's just a really, really tough situation to be in. So um, you're probably not familiar with the algorithm for refractory hypoxemia on a vent, I would presume. But with COVID patients, we were maxing out this algorithm all of the time. So all of these patients were on continuous neuromuscular blockade, and they're prone to, in order to improve oxygenation. So by prone, I mean, they're laying on their belly and eventually in some patients, we'd get them what's called a road to prone bed. So that's this bed over here. It's this nifty little ICU bed. And what it does is it kind of rocks back and forth. It can flip all the way around. So this bed can prone a patient or supine a patient. Now, as you can imagine, let's say we have a male in our intensive care unit who is 350 pounds, and he needs to be proned. That takes a substantial number of staff members to do that outside of a rotoprone bed. In addition, this patient has an endotracheal tube. They probably have a central line. They probably have an arterial line. They have a Foley catheter. So when you go to manipulate a patient like that, that's critically ill, anything can happen. If someone's hemodynamically unstable, just the change in intrathoracic pressure with moving their body can cause profound changes in hemodynamics up to the point of a cardiac arrest. When you prone a patient, you have run the potential of dislodging an endotracheal tube, pulling out a line. So it's by no means a benign thing to prone a patient, but many of these patients with COVID-19, we had no choice. We would have a patient on the maximum vent support they could be on. They would be paralyzed. They would be on, you know, hundred percent FiO2 and their oxygen saturations would be in the sixties and proning really was one of the few things that seemed to make a difference. So this is just a little glimpse into the COVID ICU and kind of what that was like. So in her situation, she actually had a very prolonged hospital course. Um, she was on the ventilator for at least 30 days. She had multiple complications. Um, I didn't put this on the slide, but she actually was in profound, just vasodilatory shock for 
such a long period of time, was on high dose vasopressors for a really long period of time. Um, her digits, her fingers, toes became ischemic from the high dose vasopressors. And she ended up having to have multiple fingers and a partial foot amputation, um, you know, really just disfiguring things for someone that's, you know, 40 years old. She developed a stress ulcer, had a large GI bleed, and ultimately her family made her comfort measures and she passed away. So, you know, I don't want to be, of course, morbid with my case study, but also, gosh, welcome to an ICU because this is a lot of the time. And welcome to an ICU in the age of COVID-19, where we saw dozens of people die, dozens of people die despite maximum support and doing everything we could. So, you know, it's tough, tough with these really young people like this, but as you can see, um, you know, everything in the world has been done for this patient besides VV ECMO, which is a kind of another topic and, um, it just wasn't enough. So that's case number one. <laughs> Case two, this is a 55 year old male, diabetes, hypertension, who presents to the emergency department with substernal chest pain. This has resolved. So he's admitted under the internal medicine service. Cardiology says he'll consult and they're going to kind of monitor him. They're going to check some cardiac enzymes, get an echocardiogram, maybe a stress test the next day. We'll see. At 2 a.m., because everything always happens at 2 a.m., he has sudden severe substernal chest pain, radiates to his left shoulder. He becomes sweaty, saying, I can't breathe. His nurse immediately gets an EKG, and here it is. So if you're not familiar with EKGs, this is an anterolateral STEMI. You see in the anterior leads, lateral leads here, ST elevation, this is the ST segment here, it's elevated. And then you see reciprocal change. You see ST depression over here in these inferior leads. This is a STEMI. So that's a transmural MI, and this has been studied and studied, and there's a million guidelines on it. One of them is door to balloon time, which is how quickly can you get this patient to a cath lab? So we're not involved with the patient yet. This is what's going on on the floor. Remember, this is the patient of internal medicine. So we're just sort of in the dark at this point. So they page the interventional cardiologist. They say, this is a STEMI. You need to come in. We're activating the cath lab. Let's get ready to take this guy and, and see what needs fixed. All of a sudden, the patient develops this rhythm here. This is monomorphic VT. He is unresponsive and pulseless. So this rhythm, you can have a pulse. In his case, he did not. So they call a code overhead. And that's when I get the pleasure of meeting this gentleman is during his cardiac arrest. So we start ACLS. We defibrillate this gentleman. He has recurrent monomorphic VT. He's defibrillated again. He gets loaded with amiodarone, which is an antiarrhythmic that works really well for ventricular rhythms in addition to atrial rhythms. And he has sustained ROSC. That's return of spontaneous circulation. The best part is that he's following commands. He's neurologically intact. So one of the worst things that can happen with a cardiac arrest is in those moments of really poor perfusion to all organs, the brain is poorly perfused. Anoxic brain injuries occur. And a patient can have severe neurologic deficits from a cardiac arrest up to the point of complete brain death. So fortunately for him, he is neurologically intact. He's following commands. He's stable. He's taken emergently to the cath lab. So this patient, this is a picture of the kind of fluoro that you can see in the cath lab. So these are the coronary arteries and you recognize that they're being filled with contrast. You see all this dark stuff. And then you see like narrowings. You see this narrowing here is 95% mid LAD. Now, if you've never heard of an LAD, it's the left anterior descending artery. And it's what is commonly referred to as the widow maker in sort of lay people's terms. So this is the left anterior descending widow maker artery. So he gets a stent placed right here. Blood flow is restored. He is started on the appropriate medications for someone who is post-acute MI. 
And then he walks out of the hospital just a few days later, completely normal guy, neurologically intact, having lived through what could have been an event that ended his life. So this is the better, happier aspect of what can happen in an intensive care unit um, or even just in a critical care job in general. You know, rapid intervention for some patients in some situations can really be life-saving and you can prevent someone from having death or bad neurologic outcome or a whole host of other negative events. So those are my two cases. I do have a little bit of advice for anyone who wants to consider pulmonary critical care as a PA. Um, one is to spend substantial time learning inpatient medicine first. So remember that pulmonary critical care is a subspecialty and it's really hard to learn an inpatient subspecialty without a really good fund of inpatient knowledge. So when you're in PA school and they set up your rotations, you may have some say in those or an opportunity to coordinate some of them on your own. Make sure that you're really getting good inpatient rotations. I've met many PA students who have had very little hospital exposure on their rotations. They've mostly been outpatient. And I, I feel that it's really hard to move into an inpatient job after that. So if you don't get a lot of in patient rotations, consider trying to get a job, maybe out of school doing inpatient internal medicine. Again, I feel very strongly. It was like the perfect first job. You really get to see everything. You get to learn um, really, really good experience. You should attend a procedure based conference or workshop before starting. So there are a whole host of procedures that I mentioned that we do. And although in PA school, you learn how to place a chest tube, how to place a central line. Doing it one time on a mannequin on school and then moving on is not the same as being really genuinely prepared to do it in real life. So yes, at your job, they will likely teach you procedures. When you're going to do procedures in general, you have to have credentials. So like I have independent credentials to intubate. I receive those credentials after having a certain number of proctored intubations. So I had to do, I don't remember the number. I had to do many intubations with a physician proctoring me and then sign off on each individual one saying, yes, she's competent. Yes, she's competent. Take the collection of paperwork of all those procedures that were monitored, submit them to a committee. They review them. And then they tell me, yes, you can do those procedures procedures independently. So you will have some level of proctoring when you go to start your job, but there is nothing worse than showing up at a job and expecting someone to just give you the whole cake. You really need to have the cake. They will give you the icing. So for procedures in particular, I would go out of your way to make sure you're really well prepared. You can start with YouTube videos, but a conference really helps you kind of get in the groove and get the manual dexterity down for doing things like that. I would spend a lot of time trying to learn vent management. Vents are really hard and it's something that's not well covered in school at all. Um, you know, most of the medical students who rotate with our group or the PA students who rotate with our group have very little exposure to vents, vent management, vent modes. So that's something that I would really recommend you do some reading on your own time and even consider a conference that is solely on vent management. So within the first year of my practice, before I started critical care, I went to a solely procedure based conference. And then within the first six months, I went to a three or four day conference that was entirely on vents for multiple days. That's how much there is to know on that one topic. So spend time learning vents, learn point of care ultrasound. And I think this really holds true for you to going into medicine in general, whether you're going to be in the emergency department, hospitalist medicine, critical care, ultrasound is the future. So if you're going to be a PA, physician, does not matter. This is a skill that you really, really have to have. There are a lot of conferences out there. There is a lot of material on YouTube. 
spend time. You should know all the basic views of an echo. You should know a fast exam. These are all sort of foundational skills now for all clinicians in the hospital. So learning point of care ultrasound should be at the top of most of your guys' lists if you're wanting to move into any hospitalist, hospital-based field of medicine. And in general, be ready to read and attend a lot of conferences. You know, the world of medicine is constantly changing. And even if you've seen something 500 times, the 501st time that you see it, it'll be different. So you're constantly learning. You constantly have to be willing to spend the extra time at home to read an article, read the study that just came out about COVID or whatever it is so that you're up on the latest things in your field. And then as an aside, I did start this company called Strive Coaching. For those of you who don't follow me on Instagram and don't know me, I graduated with $161,000 in student loan debt, and I paid it off in 16 months. So that sort of prompted my journey into personal finance. And now uh, my husband and I are on our way to being able to retire by probably 45 if we want to. So this company is my way of sort of giving back to healthcare professionals, making sure that everyone graduates feeling like they know what to do with their student loans and make the most out of their income. So yet again, you should check me out on Instagram. I'm at Strive with Kristen. Um, if you have any other questions, I would love to talk to you either on Instagram or by email, or you can just put it in the chat right now and I can uh, hopefully answer any questions that you can think of. That was awesome, Kristen. Um, that the striving coaching, that's really, really cool. Um, I know the debt is a huge issue, not just in PA school. I mean, any health related graduate school you want to go, like that's so that's really neat. Um, but I do have a couple questions for you. And this is also time if you guys have any questions, drop them in the chat. But I do have some. Um, Amber wants to know, I don't know if you mentioned it, um, but how long have you been at PA? Five years. Five years. Yes. Um, and, um, Hilly wants to know, uh, how long does, how does your role as a PA differ, um, from that of an NP? Great question. Um, that depends really on local practice. So within my group, it is completely the same. Our group treats PAs and NPs as though we're completely equal in all regards. Some states and P's have independent practice. Some states PAs have independent practice. They're not always the same states. So depending on where you go, they'll be sort of team PA or team NP. But at the end of the day, I think there's no consistent trend that one can do X and the other one can't. Gotcha. Um, another question uh, from somebody is, it, was it difficult learning all the terminology um, and the medical stuff? Um, what are some... Tip to some tips for like retention and um, studying material that you Gosh. yeah I think the, the terminology is hard especially not necessarily the names of disease states is hard but for me what was harder was the names of medications and then remembering the generic and the trade names as well and you know I tried and tried and tried to memorize that but for me the thing that made it stick was when I started to hear it used in conversation consistently so the more time you spend actually, you know, in the world of healthcare, which I know is hard right now, but the easier it is to pick up the language and to retain it. It's really hard to do, you know, flashcards or something like that and have it stick. But, you know, when you see something for the first time, you'll never forget it. And so then those medical terms just kind of stick in your head. Um, another question from uh, Lisa is that, oh, I know you touched on a little bit of advice at the end, but what did you personally do for patient care experience and healthcare experience for, um, prior to applying to PA school? For shadowing, I really just kind of networked with people that I knew by um, acquaintances. And then as far as getting the minimum number of hours, I worked in a memory care facility um, in an assisted living. Now I had a really good time. I enjoyed the experience, but it did not really adequately prepare me for PA school. So I've found that the people that were paramedics first or the people that scribed in the emergency department seemed to have had better exposure than what I had as a CNA in a memory care facility. So if those were options, I would probably err on the side of those. 
that's that's neat to hear normally yeah i also personally know that like cna is like a very heavily uh, rated option but that's that's good to know that like um, being a paramedic or prescribed you know sets you up a little bit better um another question i know like every night is different but mark wants to know how many emergency emergency do you typically see in your chef that you work at nighttime like how many cardiac arrests or just emergent events emergent events if there's a count to it oh there's always at least one a night there's always at least one crashing person or one crashing airway or one cardiac arrest there's never an, a totally uneventful shift i know you mentioned um you work seven nights like how do you keep up with working night after night after night seven nights in a row and how what, what is your um like shift yeah. like 12 hour shift or is it eight, eight hour shift it's a 12 hour shift and i drink a lot of coffee um, I do have like a very specific routine when I'm on nights that helps me. So I, I go to bed at the same time every day. I get up at the same time every day. I exercise every day, right. When I get up because I'm a morning worker out or so that helps me like switch my body over. And then I do honestly drink a lot of coffee. There you go. Coffee keeps you strong too. Yeah. I like, I like night shifts. I think they're just like, gives you your day open, but you know, not yeah. everybody they're fun they're genuinely fun you know the day the day is just different there's a lot of people around it's a lot more organized and I think more of it becomes routine work I mean speaking from someone who did that where I you know was rounding on inpatients the night is just always sort of like a popcorn of events and there's always something fun happening so I like it um there's another question were you ever interested in becoming a um NP over a PA. I think that's what she means. Um, so I actually started out pre-med. And so I had pursued a biology degree and I didn't really change my mind probably until junior year. So at that time I have a biology degree almost completed. So the prerequisites lined up perfectly for PA school to become a nurse practitioner. You have to be a registered nurse first and their degree is completely different than a biology degree. So I would have had to completely like start over school if I wanted to be a nurse practitioner. Gotcha. Um, another question you mentioned in the beginning, like I, I want to know about it too. Um, like you can pursue uh, residency options. What are some kind of residency options that you could, that you could do after graduating from PA school? There is actually more now than there used to be. Um, I'm trying to think if I can remember, like there's a NICU one, I believe that's at UK. Um, I have an acquaintance who's in a surgical one at Johns Hopkins. Um, I believe, I know there's a critical care one at Vanderbilt. They're kind of spaced throughout, but they really tend to be subspecialties. So I haven't seen ones in like primary care or inpatient hospitalist work because it tends to be the fields that you genuinely graduate and like you just don't know enough to work in them um, without doing you know the fellowship training that physicians do. So those kinds of fields have fellowships or I'm sorry, residencies, they tend to be a reduced pay. So it may be a year, maybe two years, but you're not probably going to make the full salary. Um, it'll be reduced and then you'll get a job afterwards with sort of the average PA salary. I mean, yes, in topic of the salaries, what is a typical compensation for a PA like on average? Um, sure. The national average right now is 112,000. So That's across all states and all, and all specialties. So it widely varies. Of course, surgical specialties pay more than primary care. Um, you know, California pays more than Indiana, those types of things. Gotcha. And, and one more thing, I know after you graduate from PA, from med school, it's like, there's a match program that happens for PA school. What kind of like, how do you get like a job? Do you just apply straight or is it like a program that you have to go through? So the residencies you would apply directly to, there isn't a match type of program. Otherwise you just apply to jobs. Um, I personally networked my way into every job I've ever had. And I used my rotations for networking and that's how I got employment after school. Um, but you can just, you know, get on indeed.com if you want to and apply to jobs in Oklahoma. I just find that it's easier if you use your rotations network well to get jobs, especially in a market that's becoming more saturated now than it was when I graduated. Gotcha. So as soon as you, so you, as soon as you graduate and you're done with your certification, you're open to apply anywhere you want to, and depending yep. on what you want, just network ahead yep. of time. 
Okay. Um, Kathleen wants to know, I think you, did you say you were a CNA in a um, nursing home? Right. Yes, it was a memory care assisted living. So it wasn't the skilled nursing part, but yeah. it was part of a larger nursing home. Gotcha. And, and she, her question is that, do you think you would have had a better learning experience being a scene in a hospital as opposed to a memory care? That's a great point. Probably. Yes. Because even like, for example, as a scribe, it's not that you're necessarily doing more because a lot of times, you know, they're just in the room, but sometimes being in the room is helpful. Like you're in the room for the cardiac arrest. You're in the room for the intubation. Maybe you're not seeing the cords, but at least you kind of see what things look like. And so I think being, you know, a CNA in a hospital would at least give you some of that too, where you may be around and watching some stuff happen so that you just have more exposure than I did in sort of a memory care type of setting. Gotcha. Um, another question for you, like, it's like currently as a PA, like I know you work nighttime, but how's your role uh, with like working with an MD? Like, how, like is there an MD? I'm, I'm sure there's an MD in the hospital at nighttime, but like, yeah. How does that vary from daytime to nighttime, I guess? Yeah, so actually at nights, we do not have a physician from our group in the hospital. Oh. From the pulmonary critical care service, our physician is on backup call. So if we have any issue that we can't resolve on our own, we call them. So more than often, more often than not, we'll call, discuss a case, and then move forward. It has happened on occasion where they do have to come into the hospital for something that's going on. Usually that's if someone needs an emergent bronchoscopy because our hospital will not credential advanced practice providers to do bronchoscopies. Now I have met other people virtually on social media that are PAs that are credentialed to do bronchoscopies, but our hospital will not allow that. So if anyone needs an emergent bronch, our physician will come in. If we have a case we want to discuss with them, we'll call and staff a patient, but otherwise they are actually not there in house. During the day, there's a whole group of people because there's just a lot more staff. So I think there are three or four advanced practice providers and then four or five physicians mm -hmm. that cover all of the ICUs and then the step down patients on our service as well. So that worries a lot. It's a nighttime, like not really in case there's a need, then physician will call them. Right. Other than that, it's right. just guys running the show. Um, Another, I think we're pretty much caught up on um, questions. Uh, I see one more from Amanda about um, languages. How much do you think speaking another language would help in this field as being a PA? Like, do you face like a barrier in terms of communication and having a foreign language is helpful and how so? I think it'd be very helpful. I very frequently have to use our interpreter service and um, it's like an electronic virtual one and it's very flawed and takes a lot of time. Um, you know, I think if you know where, what area you want to work in and you know what other languages are common besides English, learning one would be extremely effective. We have one provider that speaks Spanish well, and I think that's helpful for her sometimes. But for example, we have a lot of patients that speak Hakuchen and none of us speak that. So we're all constantly on the language line or using Marty and it's complicated. So if you live in an area where another language is extremely common, I think learning it would be a huge benefit to you as a provider. Okay. So like, depending on the area, like your language can be beautiful. Okay. Um, another last question. I know we've, we've had a lot of questions, but this last question before we wrap it up, um, in, in, as does being a pharmacy, pharmacy technician count as, um, like receiving patient care hours or, or no? Oh, that's a great question. I'm not sure for PA schools. Honestly, I didn't ever, I've never met a PA that that's what they did. So I can't say for sure that that would be allowed. You probably have to look at the admission criteria for whatever program in particular you're looking at. Gotcha. Um, before we go out, any piece of advice for anybody who's applying to PA school right now um, and for interviews or anything like that? Sure. Um, yeah, I've done a bunch of interviews for Butler and I'll tell you what really kind of works from, um, from the standpoint of the people interviewing you is you sort of being a person that they would want to spend time with or have care for their family members. So, you know, academically, of course, it's important to be strong. Everyone will have extracurriculars. Everyone will have volunteer hours. Everyone will have patient care hours. I think you coming to the interview, you being someone that's very clearly 
you know, just reasonable. Someone that you would want on your team will really sort of change whether or not you're selected. Ultimately, whoever's in this PA program with you is going to spend a lot of time with you and you're going to spend a lot of time with the faculty. So they want people that they feel like they can mentor and that they're going to have a positive experience mentoring. Um, I think most of the people that have a really strong application and then find that they're not getting in, it's mostly driven by personality and your approach to interacting with others and interacting in group settings. Okay. So like, I know like a nervousness also plays a bit of a role when you're in there sure, yeah uh, outside of like that like how do you like show them like you know you know i know the nervousness expert kind of like takes sometimes like affects that but like how do you like show that you're somebody like you know showing can show those um things that you mentioned i think just keep in the back of your mind that it's not you sort of cutting down someone else like for example in a group exercise you cutting down someone else doesn't increase the likelihood that you get in. So if you go into it with an attitude that you want to be supportive to everyone that's in your group or around you, and that by lifting them up, you're also lifting yourself up, you will find that the outcome is much better for you. But I've seen people in group exercises, for example, where someone will make a mistake and they'll say something sort of condemning or condescending to them. And that to somebody that's observing or deciding, you know, application status, that is more condemning to you than it is to the person that made the mistake. So I know nerves are a big factor, but try to remember that the competition is over when you go for the interview, you know, you're there to represent yourself well. And if you have a super competitive spirit in that moment, it will probably come across poorly. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes that makes sense too. Um, but I think that's it for questions and, and okay. most about time. But I think that was it. That was a really really good call. I learned a lot about about it too, and the audience feel the same way. And we got to answer a lot of questions. And the case study was really cool. Um, so I want to thank you for taking the time to come speak with us and giving the information out to students. And everybody was um, and he's extremely grateful for it. Um, and before I close out for everybody. Um, so we'll continue to have these calls every week um, if you want to stay up to date um, with what we're doing. I know physician assistant um, is a lot. Uh, it's a very um, popular uh, healthcare field that I don't, shouldn't say popular. Um, it's going to be, in, I should say, in demand in the future. And a lot there's a lot of interest in that field. We've done a few calls in the past, too, um, in different aspects. Um, so if you're interested, be sure to check that out. And and we'll continue to have more calls in the future and all that um, information will be posted um, on our Instagram page so, so you can stay in touch through that. Um, but before I close, I want to say thank you again for Kristen. It was, it was great having you. Thank you for having me. I 